Good morning. It's Friday, September 3rd. Welcome to Morning Medical Update Day. He is back. Chief Medical Officer Dr. Steve Stites joining us here in studio and also joining us virtually is Dr. Vincent Racaniello. Yeah. He is a microbiologist at Columbia University and host of This Week in Virology podcast. So we are glad to have you with us all the way from New Jersey today. Thank you. But first, let's uh, check in with Dr. Hawkinson. Yeah, and, hi. Uh, tell us about the COVID count. Thank you. Yeah, so we have a total of 103 patients right now. But uh, of those, 55 are active infections with 16 in the ICU and 12 on the ventilator. We have 10 of those 55 active infections that are fully vaccinated. Uh, so that is 18% fully vaccinated. But as we stated yesterday, a lot of those patients are actually um, able to get third doses, so they are immunosuppressed patients. Uh, we still have 48 additional patients as well in that recovery period, so for the total of 103. And we should note we did have a death uh, overnight, and that patient was unvaccinated. So that goes along with yesterday uh, when we had two deaths, and those patients were both unvaccinated as well. And Hayes has um, 11 uh, patients, nine active infections, and two in that recovery period as well. All right, thanks for an update on the numbers. Uh, we're going to get to reporter questions here in just a moment, but Dr. Hawkinson, I'm going to let you do the honors and uh, welcome in our guest all the way from New Jersey this morning. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'd like to introduce Dr. Vincent Racaniello. He's a virologist and has spent uh, his whole career working on um, viruses, particularly polio, vi polio virus, but also a lot of different uh, viruses. Has a lot of knowledge, is a great teacher. He has uh, podcasts available. He has lectures online available, but overall uh, his method of teaching, his way of teaching and getting complex issues, especially as we are now in the pandemic, getting complex issues to the layperson and really letting everybody understand he is an expert at that. And so I'd just like to welcome in uh, Dr. Reck and Yellow. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having yeah. me. And, and I love those kind words early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> we just want to know, we're, we're, you're in New Jersey, but you must have to go into New York sometimes. Yeah. Does that mean after Hurricane Ida you have to swim to work? That's right. Yesterday I, I swam to work. The trains were all shut down, and mm. uh, I, had to, I had to swim, and I'm not very good, so it took me a long time, but I got in. <laughs> well, just keeping you and your family safe, we hope. All right. Yes. Uh, do we have reporter questions on the line this morning? We do not on this Friday. Dr. Stites, good morning. You got some sleep last night. I did watch out for that because I'm dangerous when I slept. Okay, you're on some sort of roll. So <laughs> yeah, here we go. get us kicked off on this Friday. Yeah. You know, some interesting things. First of all, I am so happy we have this expert because I want to talk a little bit about the mu variant and what we have to have to fear from the mu variant because um, it seems to be getting more cases in South Korea, Japan being reported, and whether or not that's going to represent a threat and whether or not there's going to be much vaccine um, uh, resistance from that. And then just kind of a, a couple of other really important discussion points, I think, about the natural course of the Delta variant and, and the risk of exposure to all of us. So this is a great discussion. And then important information coming out overnight um, from Bangladesh looking at a very large randomized trial about masking or not masking and showing that how effective masking is. As people would say, this has put the nail in the coffin of the anti-masking argument. I would argue that we do that every day in the health mm -hmm. system because our, our, our employees stay safe every day. We don't have transmission inside the hospital, taking care of 103 COVID-19 patients. Folks, that's a cluster. And if you can do that safely wearing surgical mask and N95 mask, then the reality is masking does work and can keep us all safe and allow health systems to be able to take care of everybody because we're not overwhelmed by the complexity and the, and, 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 and the number of Delta variant patients that we have. And I'm sure our guest agrees. Let's bring back in Dr. Rackin Yellow, again, host of This Week in Virology podcast. Um, this started back in 2008 and covers all things viruses, but really has gained a lot of traction during this past year and a half with COVID-19 and the pandemic. So good morning to you. How are you today? I, I just want you to tell us a little bit about your background. Tell us a little bit about yourself. So I'm a scientist. I'm a PhD. Uh, I trained in virology with Peter Palazzi, who is a well-known influenza virologist, and then with David Baltimore, uh, the Nobel laureate. And I started my lab at Columbia in 1982. I've been doing research on a, a variety of viruses, including poliovirus, most recently Zika virus, hepatitis C virus, and now uh, enteroviruses that cause paralysis uh, in kids. And so uh, I have a long career doing research, but also uh, quite a few years ago, I got involved in writing a textbook 
of virology, which is now in its fifth edition. And that gave me the idea to start podcasting and blogging and in teaching a virology course at Columbia, which I record and uh, put on YouTube. So, you know, I was just quietly teaching the world virology, anyone who would listen. And then the pandemic comes along and suddenly uh, we're in demand. So nothing like being in the right place at the right time. For sure. And I mean, everything going online and social media, what's it been like, you know, when you started to blog about these things that you have been teaching, what has that been like for you? That's quite the transition. Well, in a way, it's continuing teaching. It's just slightly different because you have a really big audience, more people than I ever taught in any classrooms, and they're vocal, right? That's the whole point about social media. They can respond to you. So I find it quite interesting and challenging because most people want to learn. They have uh, good questions. I've recently discovered in the past year live streaming, and I'm really planning on exploiting live streaming to teach. I think it's a great way to teach a course and have lots and lots of people uh, listening in. So in the end, I'm still a teacher, and, and that's clearly what I was meant to be. We get a lot of feedback, and people are very vocal with us, too, Dr. We Stites, do. Right? We, we, know live the feeling. we live stream every morning, and it is a good feeling. <laughs> you get that interaction with your audience. We answer questions every day right from our audience. And, and I think uh, I, I, you, your points about being a teacher uh, are heartwarming to me. I was a residency program director very early in my mm -hmm. academic life, and, and uh, that's still one of the best jobs I ever had because you do get to be a teacher and mentor. And, and um, that is a rare um, privilege, I believe. Yeah, and now all three of our doctors right here on this panel are thrust in front of people answering questions yeah. and doing your thing. And some of us are pretty goofy looking and are pretty goofy at heart. And so the, this is, you know, you just come, come out and be goofy. I admit, I'm a Star Trek nerd, and, and I can quote Spock as well as just about anybody. We love our nerds around That's here. That's what we do, live long and prosper. <laughs> right. Okay, so, Doctor, I wanna, uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions. I'm sure we're going to have questions from our community, and, and both uh, Dr. Hawkinson and Dr. Seitz will have questions for you as well. But I'm going to just squeeze a few in here. So some of the questions that we get daily on this show, and I just want your insight and your thoughts. Do the vaccines not work well? anymore after a few months. That's something people ask about. What are your thoughts? Well, of course, they work well. And whenever you ask, do the vaccines work, you always have to define what you mean by work. And this is a problem I see in the mass media. They don't define it. So what does work mean? The vaccines were tested originally to prevent COVID of all kinds. They were never tested to prevent infection. In fact, most human vaccines don't prevent infection. What they do is prevent disease. The polio vaccines famously do not prevent you from getting infected with polio virus, but they do prevent you from getting polio. And it's the same with the COVID vaccines. And so why is that? Shortly after the COVID vaccines were tested, everyone who got the vaccines had high antibody levels. So indeed, that did prevent infection. But naturally, antibody and T cell levels decline after vaccination, and therefore people started to be infected. And it began this whole narrative that the vaccines are failing. But they still, to this day, no matter what variant is involved, the vaccines will save your life. They will prevent you from getting serious illness, and they will prevent you from dying. So the answer is the vaccines still work very, very well when you define it as preventing serious COVID. Let's talk about boosters. I know you wanted to mention that, and that's something people ask about daily here as well. What are you hearing from your public? So many people are confused about the narrative around boosters. As you know, the CDC has suggested that, well, for certain populations, boosters are certainly indicated for immunocompromised populations, but they're indicating that maybe the general population is going to need a booster. And what's that based on? It's based on the fact that antibody levels decline after vaccination, which they do normally for every vaccine, and they want to boost those antibody levels back up again. But they're going to go down again in six to eight months. And so I fear we're going to get in an endless cycle of boosting every year. What is very clear, as I've just said, is that we still prevent serious disease. We, we may get a mild infection after being fully vaccinated. But as a friend of mine said, it, I thought it was just a cold. And I, w I would not normally have even paid attention to it. We, the vaccines are preventing you from getting sick and seriously ill and dying. If that changes, then I think we would need to have a, a third dose or some kind of a booster, perhaps. 
But until then, I think it's premature. And, you know, we have a surplus of vaccines here in the U.S. I would really like to see us share it with a big part of the world that has no vaccines. Dr. Hawkinson, did you have something to add? No, I, I think. Oh, okay. I, I thought you were shaking my head. I, I, you're I think, agreeing. <laughs> I think it, it gets tough for the general public because, you know, we hear, okay, two doses is just fine. Well, now if you're immunosuppressed, now you need three. And now they're looking at other subpopulations, age maybe, mm -hmm. or months out. And what we have seen consistently still, just, just like Dr. Rack and Yellow said, is that we are protected from those worst cases of disease, even in those elderly. Now some information is coming out, well, maybe not in some populations like the elderly. And so at what point do we get to, well, now three doses is full vaccination or just as he said, are you getting into the cycle of continual um, yearly uh, redosing or boosters as well? And I think that is still what we are trying to figure out. So we know that Delta is spreading very quickly. Some thinking the surge is going to be worse than it was back in this past winter. Um, is the Delta variant more deadly or does it cause more serious disease? Well, that's a great question. And I don't see any convincing data that say it's it causes more serious disease. Uh, in fact, none of the variants that have arisen. We've had several pass through the U.S. and be displaced by new ones, and that will continue to happen. Uh, they get blamed for being more transmissible, more virulent, more deadly, more contagious. But in reality, none of this is ever proven because we're in a fast-moving pandemic, and the work that you would need to be done to prove that is very hard to do. Now, uh, I think there'll be more variants coming along. They'll displace Delta and, and this others will displace them. And it's just a matter of viruses evolving that are more fit than the previous one. They're better able to reproduce in the population. And we have to remember that we have no idea if the original SARS-CoV-2, the one that arose way back in the end of 2019, if that were here today, we have no idea if it would be doing the same thing or something different. So I, I think Delta is here right now. It's the majority virus, and we cannot say that it's doing anything different than any other virus so far. Do you think there's any concern that we're seeing more kids hospitalized? The pediatric hospital we have an affiliation agreement with had, really didn't have very many COVID patients. Um, now they have a lot, and uh, relatively relative to them, they they got up to 22 or 25 patients. It's about a 300 bed hospital, and so um, that was before they'd have two or three patients. So, is that do you think that's just because masks came off and kids went all back together, or is that do you think some different characteristic of the Delta variant? I, I don't see that any evidence that the, the increased infection of kids has anything to do with, with a variant. I think, as you say, we protected kids early on yep. in this outbreak, right? We protected them in schools. Uh, we, we protected them at home in all sorts of ways. And then we did that less and less. And they are now the main population that is not vaccinated under 12, right? So I think that uh, that just reflects the fact that they are they are susceptible. Uh, they're going back to school now. In the summer, they were hanging out together, and that, that increased infection. It's, I think it's going to get worse in the fall as they all go back to school unless, you know, schools are careful and do masking and testing as much as they can. One of the things we've talked a little bit on our program about, I'm curious to get your input, is the Delta variant so much more transmissible? And is that what happened? Because, you know, a lot of the hot spots started in southwestern Missouri around Springfield, Missouri, a town I tend to go down to a lot when I'm in the Ozarks doing a little fly fishing. Um, but did it really start because uh, the Delta variant, or did it start because all the public health measures went, kind of basically went away? And, uh, you know, we, we banter about that, or is it a combination of all of the above? Well, that's something I, I talk about all the time because, as you may know, many public health agencies, including WHO, automatically assume that Delta and other variants that arose before it are, are simply more transmissible. Now, the property of transmission, moving from human to human in a population, is very complicated. And it's a mix of how humans behave. It's a mix of environmental conditions. And there's, a, there's something to do with the virus itself, of course. And just observing an outbreak, it's virtually impossible, in my view, to say this is the virus and this is the environment and this is the population. It's all mixed together. 
So I don't think you can say that Delta variant is inherently more transmissible until you do the experiments and they're just being done. We're not going to see those results for some time. I think a lot of the spread of variants starting with Alpha back in the UK is because people come out of lockdown, they get together and they transmit the virus. And we've made that point over and over again that please recognize that human behavior uh, is a big part of it. So as I said, if the original SARS-CoV-2 were still here, it probably would be doing the same thing in terms of outbreaks and infections because they're driven by human uh, interactions. And I, I want to point out that almost every year, variants of influenza virus arise. These are antigenic variants that escape uh, immunity. They displace previous variants they transmit very well through the population we never accuse them of being more transmissible they are simply more fit they're antigenically selected and, and unfortunately we have to change the vaccine uh, to accommodate them so it's not clear to me why we aren't applying the same observation to SARS-CoV-2 as we do every year with influenza virus yeah but the yeah. mu any, any I'm sorry go ahead oh no I was going to say I, I think and just to, to Vincent's point you know when he talked about the original Wuhan or ancestral strain or variant and it was said on TWIV uh, this past week you know I think we are still in the throes of um, the evolution of SARS-CoV-2 uh, it will obviously continue and with our technology we will be able to continue to find variants much easier than we did back 20, 30, 40 years ago as well. So that, that is the other issue to this. You know, um, are you at all concerned about the, some of the questions arising around the mu variant, or is it one we, we really don't know enough about? Well, it's another variant, right? Who knows if it's going to displace Delta? It has a lot of the changes that Delta has. It has mm -hmm. some unique ones. Uh, so far, it's it, it hasn't penetrated to the extent of Delta. It's just a matter of seeing. I mean, people are, have got that virus in the lab. They're doing antibody neutralization assays to see you know, how resistant it is and so forth. But remember, Delta is quite resistant to convalescent serum neutralization, uh, yet it, it, our vaccines still prevent serious disease. And I want to emphasize this, another point that has to be discussed. We actually don't know what antibody level is protective. Mm -hmm. We don't know the correlate of antibody protection. Um, we have some ideas, but there's no standardized neutralization test yet across uh, different laboratories. And until we have that, we're not going to know, for example, if your antibody levels drop to, to X number, what that means. Because it might be that it's, it's good enough. In a recent study, which we talked about on TWIV, where they tried to estimate correlates of protection, they estimated that... Uh, the amount of antibody, neutralizing antibody that you need to protect against any COVID, right, that goes from mild to severe, is 20% of the level of neutralizing antibodies that you see in convalescent serum. And the, the caveat there is, of course, convalescent is defined differently in different places. But the amount of antibody you need to protect against severe disease and death is just 3%. 3% of the level of convalescent serum. So uh, that tells me probably there are other uh, immune activities involved like, like yeah. T-cells. So it's really complicated. And, you know, science takes a long time. I understand that a pandemic moves quickly and we need to make decisions. And that's the problem we're running into. The two are clashing. Yeah, we, we describe it as building the airplane while you fly it. And we may have a few more parts on it, and we haven't gone down recently. We may have had a few bumpy landings along the way. We haven't gone down recently, Hawk. Yeah. Yeah, and I would really like to, to piggyback on, on to Vincent's last point about the antibodies and T cells. That is a, a great point. You know, as of today, we are able now to use the Eli Lilly monoclonal antibody combination product again. Um, initially, it was taken uh, out of circulation, out of authorization because of other circulating variants. And now that we have Delta circulating, which is quote unquote the most severe variant. But now we are able to use these monoclonal antibodies again because the spike are, is a little bit different. But even with this more, quote unquote, again, severe Delta variant, we're able to go back to antibodies that were taken out of use uh, with this. So it isn't all about the antibodies. There is the T cells as well. And just to understand that mutations in that spike protein uh, don't necessarily mean that it is a worse variant. 
Now, I think here's the really important question I wanted to ask you. As a well-known virologist, did you help Pfizer come up with this dadgum name for their vaccine, Chromari, whatever? I mean, it sounds like no. a 007 <laughs> James Bond villain. I mean, they could have called it COVID zapper or something, but what, 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 what was in that name? And, and or are you responsible for that? I, I had nothing to do with it. They, they never asked me anything. I'm just a virologist. Why would they ask me? But it's hard to name drugs, as you know. Uh, there are all yeah. kinds of uh, limitations. In fact, there's a 42-page FDA document which teaches you how to name drugs. And you have to avoid getting close to a known drug. Otherwise, you can confuse people. So I'm not a big fan of uh, Cominardi, right? They think no, it, what is it, it implies you can't say immunity, it. but uh, I think they could have done better, frankly. Uh, but like everything else, with with increased use, it'll roll off the tongue. Um, I, I have to say, I do pre I do prefer names like Shingrix. I think that's perfect, right? That makes sense. <laughs> I like Bam Lam Invimab because it's cool to say, but uh, whatever that name of the Pfizer well, vaccine. Well, I don't and, know. I, and I think, it, and there was that discussion of this on TWIV as well, but I think also in looking at the names of other drugs, especially, you know, HIV or any drugs you see on TV, uh, the the brand name drugs, they always have to have like an X, a Y, a Z, something to really stand out, like Shingrix or any linazolid, things like that. So yeah, well, there you go. All right, that's fascinating. Cybox, yeah. I'm a non-medical person, and I sit and watch commercials and wonder how in the world they come up with these names. Well, uh, marketing people. It's big business. And people okay. like you, Justin, this is, the, you, this is where you're I know, that's what I'm saying. I'm absorbing Nobody all of this. This is so, sure. oh, I wouldn't, I don't want to yeah, know what you could possibly come up with. Trekkies are not allowed in the room to name cool drugs. Right. Okay. So I want to ask, back to the vaccine, can we talk about Novavax? Who wants to sure, jump in sure. first? Yeah, what happened to Doctor? it? So Novavax looked pretty good through uh, phase one and two. So Novavax is a bit different from the mRNA and the vectored vaccines in that it's a protein. It's a protein product. They make the spike protein uh, as opposed to mRNA or the, the vectors which deliver the gene for it or the mRNA for it. So you're getting the spike protein. Uh, it aggregates, it's, it's uh, adjuvanted, it's mixed with an adjuvant to improve immune responses. And it, it's relatively easy to produce in theory. Uh, my understanding is that phase three also looked very good, mm -hmm. but uh, the phase three was completed some time ago. And where are we? Well, apparently they're having production issues and that's what is limiting. Uh, the outcome. So I think it's unfortunate because uh, it points out how lucky we were to get a couple of effective vaccines very, very soon, right? I mean, I didn't think we'd have one as soon as we did. And this experience with Novavax points out how uh, making a vaccine isn't easy, but I'm hoping that it will still, they'll still solve their problems and we can start using it to add to the global supply. Anything to add? Okay, no, I have a question no. because, like us, uh, doctor, we dispute rumors daily on the show. Doctor Seitz, you have yes. to tackle this. How do you tackle yeah. that information on your show, doctor, and your podcast? Like, what do you hear, and when information comes in, how do you sure. how do you kind of switch it around and try to get through to people? So there are all there's information uh, at all levels that's uh, incorrect. All kinds of rumors that. People get from all sorts of sources, not just uh, websites, but mass media often propagates uh, incorrect information. And we get many, many emails. You know, as part of our podcast, we read a, a number of emails and try and answer them. So we have learned, I mean, we've, we've been doing this now for many years. And the, I think the primary approach is to be nice. Just no matter how crazy... <laughs> The question is, just be nice and be calm and explain it as if you were teaching a class. When I teach my classes, I am extremely patient. No, no question is a dumb question. I never get impatient with people. I treat them kindly because I've learned that's how you get people to learn. And for the most part, my students respond well. Uh, and they really like calmness, patience, and uh, enthusiasm in particular. So that's what we do. We try and explain, well, here's what actually happens. We don't say you're wrong because that will immediately have people rise up and be defensive, right? You say, you know, that's a great point and I understand your concern. In, in particular, uh, if people have concerns about vaccination, right? The, the way to, to address them is not to say, you're out of your mind, 
you're crazy. No, that, that, that's going to make them defensive. I prefer to say, I understand your point completely, and here's why we think it's not really a concern. And then I, I think it's helpful to bring in personal experiences, like I and my whole family and everyone in my circle have received this vaccine, and that means we think it's safe. So calmness, go to the science as much as possible, but keep it simple. Uh, and personal experience, I think that's really the way to do it. And doctor, don't you think it's encouraging when people bother to ask you a question, that is the sign that they are trying to gather more information. So we get questions all the time here and mm -hmm. maybe we've answered them before and we will continue to answer them because somebody's asking, they wanna find out more information so they can make the best decisions. Dr. Seitz, what's it been like? No, I think I think that's right. You know what we try, we say we don't try to jack with the truth because there are a lot of flap jackers out there. People mm -hmm. flap their arms and jack with the truth. So we try to stay out of uh, that realm and just, repeat our answers and, and sometimes we, we say them frequently. Uh, the, the answers are pretty much the same ones. But, but that's because I think the questions keep coming back and, and, and people do have, people have a lot of fear. And the way to address fear mm -hmm. is, uh, to your point, with calm ex ex explanation and not, uh, and not being derogatory. Because fear doesn't respond well to sort of that derogatory tone. I think fear responds best to people who want to put truth and then shine a light on it again and again and again in a kind way. And I think if you do it like that, you'll make progress. And, and, and so that's, you know, I think if you're going to be a fear answerer, you have to understand that the, the, the root of fear is not found in just being angry, uh, you, angry in return. Can we get to some community questions? Can I ask you one more question? Please do. This go ahead. This, oh, you're they the first the question. Music. They no, got the you go. I'm the you community. Go. Rewind. I get the first one. Rewind. I get the first one. Okay. <laughs> Vaccination and pregnancy. Is it safe to give a woman um, uh, who is pregnant uh, uh, the COVID vaccine? Oh, absolutely. Yes, that's been tested first in the phase three, two and three trials. Some of the they they excluded initially pregnant women, but in the course of the trials, some women got pregnant and their outcome was fine. And then subsequently it's been tested in women and it is fine. And the bonus is not only is the woman protected, but the fetus is because some antibodies cross the placenta. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, if, if a pregnant woman gets COVID, it can be very, very serious because as you know, pregnancy is an immunosuppressive state and that makes it worse. So absolutely, pregnant women should be vaccinated. Thank you. No, you ask questions any old time. Okay, Isaac, though, has a question, and it's for our guest. He says, um, and this is uh, for Dr. Racaniello, because it has to do with New York City. He says Broadway shows will be returning soon with vaccine and mask requirements. Do you think this will be sufficient? Also, do you anticipate this being standard operating procedure when it comes to just our culture now when we go to venues and gather in large places and enjoy our lives? So I... I am totally with the idea that we need to get back to normal, right? Society is suffering from this tiny virus. It's brought the world to its knees. And the sooner we can get back, the better. We now have the way to do that. We know that masking works. We know that the vaccines work. So yes, I think you could go to a Broadway show. If I went, so I'm fully vaccinated, I'd, I'd go, I'd wear a mask. So I commute on trains and subways. I wear a mask all the time. We have to wear masks at Columbia. I think it's, it is safe to do that as long as everyone is vaccinated and masked up. Now, is that going to be our way of life forever? Absolutely not. We will at one point not require you to be vaccinated to go to a restaurant. You, you won't need to wear a mask because this virus will have been controlled. But it's not going to happen tomorrow. It's going to take some time. Uh, because not only here in the U.S. is only a fraction of the population uh, vaccinated or immune from recovery from infection, but most of the world has very little vaccine. And so you think about traveling. You want to go to a country to enjoy that country, yet there's a lot of infection going on. That's part of life. So until all of that is sorted out, uh, we have to do this. There's that little bit of hope that you talk about. Well, I know it's, it's about having hope. So how does it all end? How does this this particular pandemic mm -hmm. end? Um, this pandemic, as Daniel Griffin uh, likes to say, this pandemic ends with vaccination. Um, I, I am convinced that vaccination of a good fraction of the population, 80 percent or more, let's say, uh, would end circulation. 
Uh, however, many countries don't have access to vaccines, and I really think it's our job to help them. We really need to make more of an effort because it will make a big difference in curtailing uh, the outbreak. So there will always be people who are not going to be vaccinated for whatever reason. They will eventually be infected. And then we will be in a situation where 90 some percent of the world is either vaccinated or has recovered from infection. And then we will be like one of the four common cold coronaviruses that infect humans and give you sniffles every year. Most of us are immune to those. The disease as a consequence is very mild. I suspect maybe in 20 or 30 years that uh, SARS-CoV-2 will be uh, human common cold coronavirus number five. We might even not even need to vaccinate against it at that point in the future. Okay, so Vicki wants to know, I've heard that the Delta variant is transmissible within two to four minutes instead of uh, the 12 to 15 minutes with alpha. Is this accurate? Who wants to jump in? I think this is just wrong. And based on anecdotal observations, the uh, Delta variant will be stopped by the same measures that have stopped every other SARS-CoV-2 before that. Uh, physical distancing, masking, reduced numbers of people. Uh, there's zero evidence that uh, non-pharmaceutical inter interventions uh, do not work against Delta variant. Yeah, I, th I think that's a great point. We've continued since the beginning of the pandemic, even through vaccination, to encourage those non-pharmaceutical interventions, especially in those high-risk places like schoolrooms and other gathering places indoors. I think that's, that's exactly right. Thank you. Okay, I have a question for our guest. Okay, so Donna says, so is uh, Dr. Racaniello, are you saying that the Delta variant is not really different? And if you and if you if look at the virus similarly to the flu, aren't there worse flu variants than others? Great question. Very good. I'm glad you brought flu in. Uh, no, <laughs> I'm not saying Delta is not different. Of course it is different. It has a lot of changes in its proteins compared to the ancestral virus. And some of these changes make antibodies that you produce from, say, vaccination not work as well. But there, there are other properties of the virus that make it controlled by the other arm of your immune response, which is uh, the T cells. And they seem to be the reason why the vaccines still prevent a serious disease and death caused by Delta. So Delta is definitely different, but I would rather people not worry about that and just get vaccinated because so far vaccination prevents you from getting really sick. Now there certainly are uh, different kinds of influenza virus that cause different severity of disease. Absolutely. If you just look at the various uh, pandemics of influenza virus, uh, some of them are worse than others. For example, the 2009 H1N1 was relatively mild, uh, but the 1968 H3N2 was more severe. And those two viruses continue to circulate. And when we have a, an H3N2 year, there's more deaths than an H1N1. But l listen to the years. We've been studying those for many years to get those data. And we just don't have it yet for Delta. So I'm not saying that we won't eventually find that this particular virus is more transmissible or maybe more virulent. We just don't know right now. Jennifer had a question. She said she's heard talk around that the FDA approved Pfizer vaccine is different than the EUA Pfizer vaccine. Can we clear that up? Not I, I don't think it's any different. Vaccine. It's just a name. Yeah. It's the same vaccine. Yeah. Okay. I think that was a point of misinformation and, and legalese that was going around. There was somebody who was interviewed. I, I can't remember exactly what station. It was fact-checked. That person actually, uh, if we're talking about one particular incident, came back and said that he was mistaken and there wasn't a lot of issues around that. So it, it's exactly the same product. But that had came out really early on after that um, full approval was, was granted. And for those of you who don't understand the way drugs are, we talked about a little bit of what drugs are, it's kind of like saying, well, Arrowhead Stadium has a different field because it's a different name. No, it may be called GEHA field or whatever, however you say that yeah. now. But uh, the reality is it's still Arrowhead Stadium. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's kind of the same thing with, with, with these drugs. 
All right, uh, doctor, I have a question about a scientist. And since you're a scientist, I thought this was perfect for you. Taylor, can, can you clear this up? Mm -hmm. I heard someone making the claim that in 2015, the Nobel Prize was given to, uh, to scientists involved with the discovery of the use of ivermectin to save lives in Africa against malaria and parasites. Is this true? Yeah, it's true. One of the recipients was Bill Campbell, who uh, is not too far from me here in New Jersey. He used to work at Merck, and uh, he's, he's one of the people who, uh, the, the, the Nobel was actually for a number of different drugs. He got, his part was for ivermectin, which has saved many lives for treating people with parasites, as I'm sure our two clinicians uh, here today would testify. Yeah. Yeah, which is not to say it works against SARS-CoV-2, right? Cov2, right? That, let's not, be clear, because yeah. SARS-CoV-2, well, it's, it, it may be a sinister actor, mm -hmm. is not a parasite, yeah. right? It's a virus. Completely different infections. Okay, so Donna has a question, needs some clarification. Can you explain the difference between a vaccinated person who gets ill, a breakthrough case, and a vaccinated person who does not get ill? I guess I'm wanting clarification about the vaccine and what it does again. If we are all still getting infected and transmitting, just not getting serious disease, then why are we going back to business as normal, traveling, restaurants, concerts? There's a lot of questions wrapped yes. up. Yeah, yeah. jump in. Yeah, I'll, I'll let it's really our good. guests take that first and then certainly. Um, All right, so, so the, fine, one thing we have to understand when you vaccinate millions of people, everyone is slightly different. They're not all gonna respond the same way. And so vaccines are never going to be 100% in all people. So even though you hear that the vaccines are, say, 90-some percent good at preventing severe COVID and death, there's still a few percent left, and, and so some people might get severe disease. Um, so I think the key here is that most human vaccines do not prevent infection, neither do the COVID vaccines. That's a, a fact of life. There has been some noise about transmission after infection of a vaccinated person. I frankly do not see the data that support that nor refute it, but most human vaccines do depress transmission. That's why herd immunity works. So I think that's why we're starting to go back to normal because you won't get terribly sick. You're likely not to be transmitting. and. That is how vaccines work. I, I don't know why we want to put a different bar up for COVID vaccines, but uh, that's my take anyway. It seems like that's the politically popular thing to do, that bar. You yeah. know, I think the other point we make all the time is that 98 or 99 percent of our deaths mm -hmm. in this hospital, and, and, and we do have a lot of death from um, COVID-19, which is depressing to us, and we are proud of our mortality right here, but, but COVID-19 is harsh, and, and I think that what we have to remember is that the people who are dying are almost exclusively unvaccinated. So the vaccination works even against, against severe illness and death. We have more people who are hospitalized with a Delta variant who are vaccinated than we had earlier. Unclear if that's just because there's more people getting sick right now, which could well be, or what, what, what the exact answer is. Plus, when we look at the disease list of those people who are really more ill who are vaccinated, you look at that, and those are all the folks you you don't think really respond well to the influenza vaccine or to the Shingrix vaccine or any other vaccination. So it makes you think, okay, is there a failure of the vaccine or is there a failure of our body to respond to the vaccine because of our level of illness or because we're on transplant medications or cancer drugs? Yeah, and I think all of the, uh, you know, published data so far, even though, it, you know, early on in the show, we had questions about uh, infectivity and booster dosing and when do you need that six rate. Even all those data that are taken from either unpublished studies that we haven't seen or the stuff that is publicly available right now show that the vaccines continue to protect against those hospitalizations, severe disease and death. One of the larger studies out of the UK, and it was either in Lancet or Lancet Infectious Disease over the last couple of weeks, showed that only 4% of those patients um, with Delta variant and were vaccinated were hospitalized compared to the 96% of patients with Delta variant and hospitalization who were not vaccinated. So vaccination continues to significantly protect against those more severe forms of disease. And the question we've never asked is, and, and, and I think is really important, our curves began to rise six weeks after public masking and mm -hmm. uh, social distancing mandates in our area ended which has been the delay we've seen from almost every major event. It took six weeks for there to begin to really make a significant change, kind of the ripple effect. So 
one of the things we should we could ask ourselves is what would it be like if we didn't have 50 percent of our population in our metropolitan area or 47 percent of them vaccinated if that was still zero yeah. where would we be when we ended all the public ma uh, mask mandate and I, I think we would be a whole lot worse than we are today dr rack and yellow thoughts Oh, totally. I think that's a great point. Uh, and uh, I, I, I fully agree with that. In fact, I need to get both of you on TWIV to chat uh, because it would really help our audience to hear, <laughs> hear you guys yeah. saying things like that. Yeah, well, when we're from the Midwest, we're, yeah. we have a lot of unvaccinated folks. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. All right, Dr. Racaniello, I've, I've got a couple more questions, but this one's for you from Joanne. She would like to know your feelings on politicians, states, and school districts dropping or not mandating masks for kids, especially those on, under 12? It is my lifelong feeling that it is the job of a government to protect the health of its citizens. And that is done through public health measures. And public health measures are carried out by public health officials, by clinicians, not by politicians. Uh, and so politicians should steer clear of all public health measures. They should listen to what the doctors and the epidemiologists say. And the, the idea that they will interfere with a mandate on the, on the idea that it um, is, is in your line to choose what you would do is, is simply nonsense. And the most important thing is to keep people living. I firmly believe that, and I'm sure all the doctors here today believe that as well. Politicians, please stop messing with public health. Totally. You know, what we say is we'll stay in our lane if you stay in your lane. <laughs> and that way we won't swerve and hit each other. Um, so. Angela has a question, doctor, also. How do, how do you feel, what is your view on the efficacy of natural immunity against the Delta variant? Do you still need a vaccine? Oh, so if you recover from COVID, that's great. Uh, you may or may not have a, a good immune response because uh, it, it, you know, the, the virus is in you and depending on whether you have a severe, mild or, or moderate infection, that could impact your immunity. But what we have learned is that if you recover uh, from infection, then get just one dose of a vaccine, you have better immunity than anybody else. Anyone who's been vaccinated twice, anyone who's just recovered from infection, and you can actually handle all variants that we throw at you. So for that reason, I tell people, if even if you've been infected, get at least one dose. One dose is all you need. You don't need two because you are the super person of uh, COVID immunity then. Thoughts on that? Yeah, let's go. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you but, know, I, but I don't I, recommend getting COVID in order to get super immunity, just right. as a thought. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and I think that's a great point because we even do have some, you know, some people in the uh, general public, some people, uh, you know, uh, in, our, in our health system, colleagues, friends that we're with who have recovered, uh, who maybe just had mild disease. And I think it is important to continue to encourage that vaccination, you know, at least one dose. Now, again, still being considered fully vaccinated under the specific guidance is two vaccinations, uh, two doses of that mRNA. But I think that's a great point. And we have very good studies showing increases in antibody levels, increase in the diversity of those B cells and those antibodies to create those, uh, the, to create those antibodies to help deal with those new variants that do come around as well. You know, I think the, the importance of this whole discussion really has been that people need to trust the science people, right? <laughs> Trust the science, mm -hmm. which, by the way, is a line from the second season of Star Trek from Tilly. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, the uh, discovery. Uh, trust the science, people. And what we're really, and, and, and I know that there are times where, where science has gone off the rail. Uh, it did that with Nazi Germany. It did that in, in, in the syphilis experiments on African Americans here in the United States. But when you have scientists all around the world giving you the same message, science is not off the rail. It's not a few scientists telling you something weird like, I'm a functional physician and mm -hmm. you all just need to take ivermectin. You see, that, that's not real science. That's off the rail. But when you have all the scientists in, around the world really giving you the same core message, then there's something very believable about that, as opposed to politicians who don't understand or know science who give you a different message. And so I come back to trust the science, especially when that science is drowning out everyone else's voices because they have so many people around it, whether that's about global climate change or it's about masking or it's about vaccination. And I Trust think that's science. in addition to all of the publicly available, transparent 
original forms of the data, whether it's the FDA briefs from those pharmaceutical companies or whether it's those peer-reviewed articles. All of those COVID things are available to the public. They are very transparent. Anybody is able to go through those and read those and critique those if they have, you know, obviously the skills to, to read those. But, but it is all transparent. It is all publicly available as well. Dr. Racaniello, thank you so much for joining us today. You are welcome back anytime. You can check out his podcast, The Week, This Week in Virology. So thank you again. I want to give you a moment to uh, share your final thoughts with us, though. It's been a pleasure uh, being here, and I think this is a terrific forum. I can't believe that uh, you do it every day. Kudos to you <laughs> for doing this. Um, I, I'm going to make this my pick today on uh, This Week in Virology so more people uh, can find it. I think it's terrific what you're doing. Uh, and it's not just because we all agree. It's because <laughs> there's good logic being promulgated here. Uh, I just want to tell everyone, stay with it. This will be over at some point. Please get vaccinated. Uh, continue to be careful. And most of all, respect other people. When you say, I'm not getting vaccinated, I'm not wearing a mask, you're showing disrespect for others. You may think it's your right to do that, but in some cases, you, you're, you should have a respect for others more so than your rights. And if we would all do that, uh, I think this would get over a lot quicker. So thanks again for having me. Really appreciate it. Doctor, thanks for coming to the table today. We appreciate you. Dr. Hawkinson, final thoughts? Yeah, just a big thank you to our guests. Please check out the podcast, TWIV. Uh, you can uh, also uh, look at him on YouTube for virology lectures, other education, live streams. It's good. Please go there and do that this weekend. Also, please have a safe weekend. And if you're not doing anything else, please go get vaccinated. Okay, before your final thoughts. <laughs> We have a little Star Trek little nugget. Oh, who knew? I know. Oh, you're so waiting. Fast. Okay, so <laughs> explain to me. I, I don't know. I'm not a Trekkie like you. Mm. Uh, I can explain <laughs> this I guess it's easily. not good to be red. Yep. Don't wear a mask. Don't be a red shirt. Red shirts are the ones who you always know are going to die on the original series because they beam down to the planet, and whoever has a red shirt on, unless it's Scotty, is going to die. And so that's the extra character. <laughs> that's the part. You can't, like, kill off. Kirk, Spock, or McCoy. So it's the person <laughs> with the red shot, unless it's in the. Uh, and every, it's is there a red? Like a is there a red shirt in every oh, episode? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure they beam to a planet. The guy, the red shirt's gone. You can say, oh, he's not going to be back. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> okay. And so that's the same thing. It's like this: wear a mask. You don't want to be a red shirt. Exactly right. Love it. Yeah, it's very true. And I and I so appreciated uh, Dr. Racaniello today. Thank you so much for being in the program, and, and a shout out to you. And, and thanks for having us on your program. That's a hoot. Um, we do just try and tell the truth every darn day, and come back and do it. And today's message is. Is one we often end with on a Friday, which is about hope. Because hope helps all of us get through this. And I think we've heard today there is a way out of this pandemic. And the way is to borrow a line from our favorite broad, my favorite Broadway play do not throw away your shot. Get vaccinated. History has its eyes on all of us. And in fact, speaking of history, the Constitution says, the <clears throat> preamble says, we the people of the United States, not either one. We're in it, this together. We can conquer it together. We all have to act together. Do not throw away that shot. All right, on the feed, people are loving Dr. Racaniello, I have to say. Great guest. Wednesday hey. coming back. We learned so much from him. Um, we're going to check out his YouTube channel today. And uh, yes, we got to have him back. Got to have him back. You're coming back. That's America's just that's awesome. virologist right here. America's <laughs> yes, virologist. Love it. That's, anytime. Uh, anytime. <laughs> And Dr. Stites, um, have you ever been to any Star Trek conventions back in the day? Deb wants to know. <laughs> Uh, of course. <laughs> Do you even have to ask these? Yeah, questions? really. And it was. I just said it was like what, well, recently. I was at the Comic Con here in Kansas City, and and Nichelle Nichols, who played Uhura, was uh, at there. Man, I, I was her. I got my picture. All right, we Deb need, was watching. We need picks in the Star Trek universe. Yeah, you would have. Yeah. Okay. I'm right there. All right. Behind the scenes with you. That's what they want. All right. Thank you all for being with us today. Due to Labor Day, of course, we're going to be back next Tuesday of next week. Yep. So here's what we're going to be talking about. Heartbreaking COVID stories that we hear everywhere. COVID deaths are emotionally draining on families as well as the staff here and everywhere. We're going to hear from someone with our palliative care team on what to say when this grief could be avoided with preventative measures like a vaccination. We'll see you back here on Tuesday morning at 8. Subscribe to our morning medical update and open mics with Dr. Stites podcasts. Now everywhere podcasts are available.